You probably have seen a woman like me standing in front of you before. I probably look like somebody you know. Maybe I'm somebody you work with. I might even be your boss, your colleague, that woman that you actually met in the boardroom at a meeting maybe on Thursday or Friday. I look really familiar. Look at the way I'm dressed. I'm wearing the perfect corporate global attire, a snazzy, simple Tahari suit with maybe some, some buttons on it, some pretty, pretty buttons on it. I'm wearing a really great pair of black pumps. I look pretty predictable, right? Well, I'm gonna share with you today, I actually wanna inspire you today to change your focus and change your lens of your view and start to think about looking for your authentic self, the search for your authentic search self and how stress maybe had an effect on you. And I'm gonna tell you my story. So you've probably seen in the movies or on TV, that woman, right? That woman who's um, probably working for a company. He, she's probably had every major wonderful job you could think of with a mix of luck and smarts and maybe a quick sense of opportunity. She got that dream job. Well, that was me. That was me. I landed that job in New York City. Yes, I did. I was that young, female public interest lawyer in Manhattan, in New York City, Columbia University grad. I had it all. I had a dream. I got the big job. I even got this giant letter in the mail that had a gorgeous, beautiful, golden seal on it that said, you did it. You did it. You got that dream job. So there I was, public interest lawyer with all the world on my heels. I did everything you could think of. I was the law and order story. I was the woman that you saw on TV. I arraigned cases at 2 a.m. at night. Yes, I did. I was in the complaint room. I even did cases that were so interesting and pretty deep. Gang initiation cases, assaults, child endangerment, rape, and murder. That was me. And I'll tell you a story. I still remember her face. That domestic violence victim, that DV victim that came into the, the complaint room on New Year's Eve on that cold night, she still had blood stains on her t-shirt. She had a black eye. She had a really severe laceration under that right eye. And I talked to her and I took a statement. And then I even went to talk to her husband. No, I didn't talk to her husband. I interrogated her husband. And I listened to him and I heard the story. And to go even further, I even had to talk with those police officers. I still remember the stale smell of a 24 hour worn old police uniform. I can still hear the crickling, crackling sound of stale Doritos that were crumpling in his pocket as he told me, you know what? As he laughed actually and said, you know what? She was almost beat into a felony, felony. but you know what? That's okay, it was just a misdemeanor, right? So that's what we did. We lived that life. I even had a rack of suits just like this in my room, in my office, with my office mates. A line of them with gold seals and fancy heels. And we were afraid. You know what? We were afraid of failing. And you know what failing really means? It means that somebody's going to go to sleep in jail, maybe for five years. But oh my gosh, if you fail, it might be 25 years. And that's stress, right? That's stress. So we did that, we laughed, we cried, and it all started to catch up. So there's the stress, right? There's the stress. I moved on. I went to Wall Street. My goodness, Wall Street. I was a financial officer in the, one of the best capital markets, companies, banks in New York City. It was amazing. We worked late hours. We ordered takeout. We got cars called for us to go home late at night. We worked on holidays. I was usually, or maybe hopefully, the last person to leave the office. And oh, I was that woman. Maybe some of you in the, today here are thinking about it. You were that woman who was maybe laying in bed at night, sleeping with her Blackberry by her ear trying and hoping, listening for that beep 
in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. Maybe it was that email from Hong Kong that you needed to respond to. So after a while, all of this successful stress caught up to me. So guess what? I had every major exciting stress-related disorder you could think about. I had those sleepless nights. I had insomnia. I had that pain, maybe that, that pain in your stomach that maybe some of you have felt before, that nagging pain that would wake you up in the middle of the night with a gasp because you couldn't breathe. And you wondered, was it an ulcer? Or, oh my gosh, was it even something more serious? So what did I do? I went on a wild goose chase for 10 years looking for the answer of what was wrong with me. I met everybody in New York City. I met the best chiropractors. I met neurologists. My goodness, I even met an orthopedic surgeon who worked for the NBA and looked at me. And you know what? Finally, after maybe that eighth or ninth doctor, somebody I trusted said to me, after I'd pretty much gotten a PhD in NANA, that person said to me, you know what? After all the MRIs and all the checks, you're actually perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with you. You just need to relax and do some yoga. So you know what? <laughs> That's what I did. I did some yoga. So I'm going to change your view, ch change your lens. You're probably assuming something about me. You're probably thinking that, you know, I'm that perfect employee that works in your office. But you know what? There's different layers of finding your authentic self, and there are different ways that you can look at yourself. So I'm just going to change your perspective for just a moment. I'm going to show you. And many of you probably have asked the question in your lives here in Accra, in Ghana, where the, one of the countries in West Africa where yoga is so new in this landscape. What is yoga? What do you do? And so here we are now, standing here today. I stand here before me, and I look like a completely different individual. So that's what I did. I've been doing yoga for the past 18 years. And what I did was, I opened, I moved to Ghana, moved back home, and opened a yoga studio, Bliss Yoga Accra. After all this research into my own body, and all of this really interesting, successful stress, right? So let me give you some numbers. Let's think about some numbers so you understand why it's so important to change your perspective and find your authentic self. Three years in the making, Bliss Yoga Accra over 1,500 classes, over 2,500 class visits, and over 800 members have decided that it's really important for them to study themselves. So what's yoga? What is it all about? You usually probably assume that a yogi or somebody who does yoga looks a certain way, right? Well, I'm going to sort of demystify that whole idea. We sometimes think that people who do yoga are these wonderful individuals who dress and wear really slim-fitting clothing, who can contort their bodies into all sorts of beautiful positions that most human beings could never, ever aspire to, right? They're usually between the ages of 20 and 30 and look a certain way. Oh, maybe they're a model. They might even be Gazelle, the international supermodel from Brazil, who poses at her home in Costa Rica on Instagram in these beautiful layers in these beautiful yoga poses. Well, I have to say to you, it's all over the media that yoga is this beautiful thing, but it is also something to do with movement and the body. And there's a Time magazine cover of Christy Turlington a few years ago. Well, I'm here to tell you that yoga is for everybody. Yoga is a form of movement. Yoga is a form of movement, and I'm just going to show you in a very brief vignette what that really means. With only a few moments in your day, maybe 30 even seconds, you can basically get on a mat, and this is what it looks like, and just maybe breathe and inhale. What might happen is your back, the back that you've been sitting in at work for so long, and when your boss told you you only had 30 minutes left for lunch, so you had to sit, yeah, and eat at your cubicle. Yeah, that's the back that you can actually relax by just lifting your arms and breathing. Maybe you can expand the spine, lean in, exhale, inhale, and adjust that knee that pain that maybe was in your knee. That's really what yoga is. That's what it is. That's how it's defined. And you know what? People are doing it. We even have NBA players like Kobe Bryant 
And Phil Jackson said that for Michael Jordan, mindful meditation was probably the most incredible moment for all of the moments that he's captivated and all the championships he's had. Jordan did it. So we're going to play the team health game. I'm going to ask you, are you going to be on team A? Are you going to be on team A? Team A spends $80 billion a year on yoga. Wow, that's huge. Well, you know what? I'm going to change your perspective. We on this planet spend an average of $879 billion a year. That's you on Team B. Who wants to be on Team B? $870 million, billion, excuse me, billion dollars a year on being sick. That's on diabetes alone. So which team are you on? After 200 hours of working in New York City, actually doing a 200-hour teacher training. I was working on Wall Street. I had a husband and a one-year-old child at home, and I went to school at night. I had three babysitters just to get here to tell you that I'm licensed to teach yoga. Why is it so important to me? What am I trying to tell you? If the essence of this talk is anything, don't forget. You can find your authentic self, and it is in that search that maybe you will further understand and better your health. Namaste. Thank you so much.